SpaceX has shared new material from Starship's 10th flight, giving a closer look at its most critical moments. Alongside this, the company has reached a new milestone in rocket reuse, and NASA has revealed its upgraded Orion Artemis Control Center. All of these updates mark important steps forward for space exploration. After the live coverage of Starship's Flight 10, many short clips and images appeared online, each showing different parts of the mission. But one scene stood out the most, the return of Ship 37 with its unusual mix of bright orange and white across its surface. This sparked questions about whether SpaceX would release clear, high-quality footage of the landing sequence. The answer came when SpaceX posted two detailed videos and two images on X, noting that they showed the landing burn and splashdown of Flight 10, made possible by the company's recovery team. For the first time, viewers could watch the final descent much closer than in previous flights, with the speed slowed enough to reveal precise movements. In the footage, Ship 37 was still completing its flip maneuver. Its flaps folded forward as the sea-level Raptor engine adjusted position through stabilizing, slowly bringing the ship upright. This sequence was not only for control, it also reduced the vehicle's downward speed, allowing a controlled and targeted splashdown. SpaceX explained that Starship passed through re-entry with some tiles intentionally removed, performed maneuvers that placed extra stress on its flaps, suffered visible damage to its aft skirt and flaps, and still landed within three meters of the planned target. Hitting that level of precision, despite the test challenges, shows significant progress in controlled landings. The moment itself was striking. As Ship 37 touched the ocean, large clouds of water and vapor rose into the air. A rainbow briefly appeared in the mist under the cloudy sky, adding to the visual impact. These tests are part of SpaceX's path toward eventually catching Starship using the Mechazilla arms on the launch tower. Every controlled splashdown helps prepare for that future. One detail received extra attention the ship's coloring. The reddish orange surface, paired with a bright white nose, led many to compare it to a small version of Mars. Elon Musk later explained that the color came from rust caused by coolant leaking onto experimental metallic heat shield tiles, leading to oxidation and iron oxide formation. Earlier flights didn't have this effect because they didn't use these metallic tiles. SpaceX clarified that the white areas were insulation applied where tiles had been removed, matching pre-flight photos. Musk noted that the heat shield tiles stayed in place for almost the entire flight, showing that recent upgrades are working, although improvements are still needed. The oxidation and discoloration show that the metallic tiles are not yet ready for rapid reuse. If large sections have to be replaced after every mission, the turnaround time will be slowed. For Starship to become truly reusable, the tiles need to handle re-entry and remain ready for multiple flights without major repairs. Adjusting the tile materials could reduce oxidation, but for now, they remain in the test phase. Attention is already shifting to Ship 38, the vehicle for Flight 11. Early photos suggest further changes to the heat shield design, but it's unclear if these will fully solve the oxidation problem or just improve durability. Flight 10 has shown that progress is being made, but more steps are ahead. Looking further ahead, Musk has said that SpaceX plans to attempt catching Starship with the Mechazilla arms starting with Flight 13. Flights 11 and 12, where Flight 12 will be the first V3 version, will still end with splashdowns. This approach will let SpaceX focus on testing and strengthening systems without risking the more complex catch attempt too soon. During Flight 10, one engine had a small explosion around the 47-minute mark, but it didn't cause mission failure. Even so, this shows that engine reliability and efficiency need further improvement, especially for long-duration missions. For deeper space flights, every part of the propulsion system must withstand extended use without issues. The aft flaps remain one of the most stressed components during re-entry, they face intense heating and mechanical forces, and past flights have shown that they are often the most affected area. Stronger materials or design changes will be needed to make them more resilient. Improving this part will be important for both safety and reusability. 
Beyond these systems, Starship's payload capacity will also need significant upgrades. Right now, it is designed to carry large payloads, but future missions to the Moon, Mars, and even farther will require it to handle much heavier and more diverse cargo without compromising safety. This means improving the internal cargo handling systems, reinforcing the payload bay, and ensuring the ship can load and unload quickly for fast turnaround between flights. The Raptor engines will also need enhancements for more raw power and for sustained and reliable long-duration burns that are required during orbital insertion, course adjustments, and precise return trajectories. These engines will have to perform under a wider range of mission profiles than they do today, with minimal degradation after multiple uses. The Super Heavy Booster, which lifts Starship into orbit, faces its own demanding upgrades. Past launches have seen some engines fail completely, cutting into performance and risking mission success. These failures need to be solved through better manufacturing quality, more robust engine shielding, and improved in-flight monitoring systems that can quickly compensate for a failing engine. Structural strength is another area needing attention, especially since future missions could involve landings with steeper descent angles, fewer active engines, or more challenging weather conditions. Such scenarios will place far more stress on the booster's frame, so its structural components must be reinforced to handle the added strain without deformation or cracks. Every one of these upgrades ties back to SpaceX's ultimate target, a fully reusable Starship system that can launch, land, and relaunch with minimal refurbishment. Flights 11 and 12 will act as crucial stepping stones, testing these improvements under near-real mission conditions before SpaceX attempts its first high-stakes booster catch with Flight 13. Meanwhile, SpaceX has reached another major milestone, setting a new record for booster reuse. On August 28th, at 4.12 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, a Falcon 9 lifted off from Launch Complex 39A, carrying 28 satellites into orbit. The booster landed on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas and became the first orbital-class rocket to launch and land 30 times. SpaceX announced the achievement soon after, with company president Gwynne Shotwell noting the progress from learning to land rockets to reusing the same booster 30 times. This milestone reflects 15 years of work refining the landing and refurbishment process, allowing reuse on a scale once thought impossible. By combining both land-based and sea-based recoveries, SpaceX has built a flexible and reliable reusability system. This has helped increase launch rates, reduce customer costs, and secure SpaceX's dominance in the commercial launch market. Among all Falcon 9 boosters, Booster 1067 now leads the fleet in reuse count. SpaceX aims for up to 40 flights per booster, putting the booster just 10 flights away from that target if no major issues arise. This achievement is a clear example of how engineering improvements can lead to practical cost savings and more frequent missions. It also shows the gap between SpaceX and other launch providers in reusability technology. Finally, NASA has introduced a new tool for its Artemis program, the Orion Artemis Mission Evaluation Room at Johnson Space Center, revealed on August 15th. This facility will act as the technical center for monitoring and analyzing Orion spacecraft performance. The Mission Evaluation Room will work alongside the Main Flight Control Room, which handles direct operations, forming a two-room setup, one for flying the mission and one for evaluating its technical health. The first use of the Mission Evaluation Room will be during Artemis II, a planned 10-day crewed flight around the Moon. The room will operate around the clock with 24 workstations staffed by experts from NASA, Lockheed Martin, ESA, and Airbus. They will compare real-time Orion data with expected performance, identify any issues, and help solve them to keep the crew safe. Data collected during Artemis II will help prepare for Artemis III and later missions, improving spacecraft systems and operational safety. Trey Perryman, Orion Mission and Integration Systems Lead, explained that while the flight team operates the spacecraft, MER brings in years of design and test expertise to support them. This new capability strengthens NASA's ability to monitor and respond to issues quickly during missions. 
With these combined developments, SpaceX refining Starship's landings and systems, setting records with Falcon 9, and NASA enhancing Artemis mission support, the pace of progress in space technology remains strong. Each improvement lays the foundation for the next stage of exploration.